Welcome to another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Elland. In December of 2012, Angela Smith's life changed forever. Her 10-year-old son, Chico, was diagnosed with a rare form of soft tissue cancer called rhabdomyosarcoma. I believe I pronounced that correctly. But cannabis was instrumental in saving the boy's life and giving him a better quality of life than he may have had otherwise experienced. And joining us from California to share her story of her son is Angela Smith. Angela, great of you to do this. We very much appreciate you taking time out. No, it's an absolute pleasure. <laughs> it's a duty, in fact, as, as much as it is a pleasure. So did I get the name right? Rhabdomyosarcoma? Yes, I'd never heard of it either until my son was uh, was uh, blessed with it, so to speak, in inverted commas. Yes, rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, it's basically um, a sarcoma type of cancer in the rhabdoid soft muscle tissue, apparently. His, his appeared as a um, tumour growing behind his tonsil, and then it ended up kind of coming out of the side of his neck. So it was in the most random, bizarre place, really. Uh, but rhabdomyosarcoma can manifest itself in lots of different parts of the body. It, it's just basically a sarcoma type of cancer in soft muscle tissue. So kids can have it in their bladder, they can have it in their arm, they can have it in their nasal, um, pharyngeal, um, is, that what it, is that what they call it? Yeah, um, head and neck, and they can have it in all kinds of different places. And it's a nasty, aggressive kind of cancer, which can actually, some adults get it, but it's very, very rare to find it in adults. Um, but it's a very nasty, aggressive kind of cancer. The survival rate is um, not great, really. It's pretty grim. Um, so it's it's not a nice uh, thing to have as your... I, I remember when we when we were first trying to get a diagnosis, um, I remember they did a biopsy and I said to the surgeon, I said, well, I, I don't even know what I'm hoping for here. Like, they knew it was some sort of cancer. And she said, well, I suppose I would hope it's a lymphoma if I were you. And it was like, oh, I can't believe I'm actually hoping that my son has got lymphoma no, as opposed no. to some other kind of cancer. Yeah, when, you know, lymphoma is like a big, horrible thing to, to think that you have as well. But, yeah, it's not, it's not a nice diagnosis, and it's a, a very grim treatment protocol as well. And his, his tumour was inoperable. It was wrapped around his carotid artery. So they couldn't do an operation. So the chemo and radiation regimen was really harsh. It was like 10 months of chemo and 28 radiation sessions. He had to go nearly every day for like five or six weeks. Um, couldn't eat. He ended up in a wheelchair to be fed through a tube. It was grim, really grim. Angela, I read that it was blocking his breathing. And uh, within 10 days, once the doctors diagnosed it, uh, his airways would be blocked. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, before it was diagnosed, basically, he was um, admitted to... Uh, we we had one doctor who said he thought it was something to do with his tonsil. So he removed the tonsil, biopsied the tonsil, and the biopsy came back negative. And it was like, yeah, great news, he's not got lymphoma, which was the big fear at the beginning. Um, and then he carried on being sick, and this lump carried on growing. So a couple of weeks later, the same doctor said, oh, I think we better send him for a second opinion. And then the doctor at UCLA that saw him looked at the scans that he'd had before the biopsy, and she said, well, he's biopsied a healthy piece of tissue. The tumour is pushing against the tonsil behind it and I was like no 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 it's fine we've had a biopsy and it's negative and she was like no 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 the tumour is pushing the tonsil uh, and I was like tumour tumour what, what do you mean it's, it can't be tumour and she had admitted us straight away it was four days before Christmas and she was like you're not going home today uh, we need to find out what, ca- what type of cancer this is and basically it was growing so fast that they said that he had about 10 days before the tumour would completely block his airways and he wouldn't be able to breathe. And it was eight days before they were actually able to pinpoint a diagnosis. Um, and in the meantime, he got sicker and sicker and sicker, obviously. He spent Christmas in the hospital. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's a very fast-growing kind of cancer. So if, they hadn't, if we hadn't been admitted when we were... Goodness knows what would have happened. I don't know. Better to think. 
You know, in, in reading Chico's story, I get the impression that you could almost see the tumor increasing in size each and every day. Was that the case? Yes, it was. It very much was. Yeah, the doctors were kind of, it was literally growing in front of our eyes, really. It was, uh, yeah, the doctors were kind of um, quite staggered by uh, by the, the, the speed of the growth. Is there any explanation as to why children are more susceptible to this particular disease than adults? No, nobody seems to know. And the problem is that I think it's something like 300 cases a year appear in the United States. So it's one of those very neglected types of cancer that very little research is done because obviously pharmaceutical companies aren't going to be able to make much profit if they do find some sort of cure or treatment for it. So it's the treatment protocol for this kind of cancer hasn't changed since the 1970s. I was When he was diagnosed, I was handed this piece of paper with the, they call it a roadmap for treatment. And I was told that this hadn't changed since the 70s. So it hardly gave me comfort, really, to, to know that that was the case. But, yeah, like with a lot of these rare cancers, they're just neglected. Um, the research money seems to be going into the more, the more popular <laughs> kind of cancers. Um, you know, apparently only 4% of uh, research money in cancer overall goes towards children's cancers, which in itself is a, a bit of a scandal, in my opinion, especially when they use bald-headed kids to try and raise money. Which was worse for Chico in terms of his treatment, the chemo or the radiation? Um, really hard to say. I mean, we kind of worked together in tandem to crucify him. Um, goodness. Um, the radiation effectively nailed him not being able to eat because it was up in his throat. So, you know, he was really struggling to eat anyway. He was throwing up every day with the chemo, uh, but then throwing the radiation as well. And it's like there was no way he was going to be able to swallow or eat anything. So that's when he started having to be fed intravenously. Um, it's this uh, stuff called TPN, which basically you feed your kid through, a, through their arm. <laughs> you had to hook it up every night, this milky white fluid. And then about, I don't know, about four months later, we uh, had him fitted with a G-tube, so we were, were able to feed him actual food into his stomach directly. And that's when, where we started giving him the oil, through the, through the G-tube, uh, which started off as a sort of clear plastic tube, and it, by the end of treatment, it was dark brown. <laughs> From the oil. Yeah. <laughs> well, how did you first find out about cannabis oil? So we first started um, to know about oil because, ironically, because the doctors prescribed Marinol, which is synthetic THC. Um, and because they prescribed Marinol, I suddenly was alert. I mean, I, I, I was a TV producer before my son got sick. So I spent all my hours in the hospital researching, researching, researching what we could do to try and help his odds of survival, which weren't. They weren't good enough as far as I was concerned. We were kind of led to believe it was around 50-50, which, you know, if, it, if they'd said he's got a 99.9% .9 chance of getting well with this, then I could have sat back and, and been okay. But 50-50, it's like, that's not really good enough. So I was online all the time trying to find out about stuff and, you know, trying to navigate my way through what was snake oil, what, what was possibly useful um so the doctors prescribed marinol so i started researching cannabis and the palliative effects of cannabis um and then two of our home nurses independently pulled me to one side and said oh the real thing works much better so asked the doctors could we have the real thing and the first time i asked they laughed and were like oh no we can't do that he's only 11 um and then i asked again a different doctor who'd actually given it to one of her friends and had had great success and she agreed on the condition that he didn't smoke it which we just laughed at because we thought well, we could possibly have given our kid cannabis to smoke so I was trying to get hold of some sort of tincture or oil that I could put under his tongue and nobody seemed to none of the dispensaries seemed to know about oils or tinctures or anything um so we were struggling with that a little bit um and then a, a 
distant family members started bombarding me with Rick Simpson information um, and videos. And one night we were bored in the hospital. So it was like, oh, go on, we'll watch this run from the Cure documentary. So we watched it. It was like, ah, there's something in this. And then we watched a Ricky Lake episode of a Ricky Lake show with a, with a couple of kids in it who'd taken cannabis, one of them for something else. Um, and so we thought, well, if the doctors are happy to prescribe it for palliative use, then they're obviously confident that it's not going to interfere with the actions of the chemo, which is always the big fear when you're looking at any kind of supplement. So I thought, well, we may as well give it to him in these massive quantities. It's like, well, in for a penny, in for a pound kind of thing, as they say in England. Um, so I found some online, bought some, I had no idea what to do with it it was just try and build up to a gram a day if you can as fast as possible so we started giving it to him and even though actually it turned out that this oil we got was not great quality um within 10 days of him on being on this oil he suddenly wanted to eat and he suddenly seemed brighter and he suddenly seemed happier and we were able he was on seven different pharmaceutical medications for various ailments and we were able to drop all of them, literally. And we'd go in for chemo, and they were like, so what drugs is he on? And I said, he's not on anything. He's just taking cannabis oil. And the doctors were like, they couldn't really believe it. Um, it was it was quite astounding, really. And then through through um, a Facebook group, a guy had introduced eight parents that were giving cannabis to their kids. Uh, we got introduced to Ricky Lake, Lake and Abby Epstein, who were doing the We the People documentary, and they introduced us to Mara and Stuart from Aunt Zelda's, who took one sniff of the oil we were giving to Chico and were like, "You can't give him this." Um, and we had it tested, and it wasn't good. And we, then we started taking out Zelda's oil, and they gave us a, a, CB, a high CBD as well as high THC. And really, things massively improved from from there on. And I'm not, I'm not saying it was a miraculous, huge turnaround because he was still having chemo, but just his general sense of well-being, the number of pharmaceutical meds that he had to have was it went down to virtually zero. We had one or two things here and there, but he was on loads of things before he was on the cannabis and none of them really seemed to be working. Um, he still threw up quite a lot, but before cannabis, he was throwing up many times every day, literally every day. He was super sensitive to the chemo and he was throwing up when he wasn't even eating. So he was, kind of throw, it was just really horrible every day. We had so many pink sick buckets all over the house. It was awful. Um, so, yeah, it, it helped with his, his neuropathy that he'd ha- he, he was in a wheelchair because he couldn't walk properly. And the neuropathy, um, the neuropathy actually stopped, dete- he stopped getting worse. And, and the expectation always is that you get worse and worse throughout treatment. And it, the neuropathy, in fact, actually improved a little bit during treatment, which was unheard of. Um, so, yeah, it helped with the, the nausea and the vomiting. It helped with the neuropathy. And it also helped um, he become addicted to opioid painkillers because he'd had a lot of them when he, when he had radiation. He had lots of pain um, in his throat and his neck. So they started giving him IV opiates. And they ended up putting him on methadone. Um, and we ended up doing a really smooth meth- methadone detox uh, by titrating the oil up as we titrated the methadone down. Um, and, yeah, it was just like I really dread to think what the outcome would have been if he hadn't had oil for the second half of his treatment. I mean, the whole the whole theory of chemo seems to be that they give them as much as they can possibly tolerate. They take them to the absolute limit. Um, like, you know, obviously they're trying not to kill them. Um but they need as big a dose as they possibly can in order to get rid of the cancer and they take them to the brink and then they stop and it's you know a lot of kids don't make it and uh, you know I, I dread to think what would have happened if we hadn't had oil for the last few months of treatment and we still give him a daily dose now we're, we're three, and, three and a half years in remission and he still takes it every day and I strongly believe it helps keep him in remission and it it makes him feel better too because he feels like he's been proactive in in dictating his health 
like it gives him confidence that he isn't going to relapse, that he isn't going to be sick again because he feels he's doing something proactive. And I think that shouldn't be underestimated either. I think you know, when, as a parent, when you feel when your kid has cancer, you feel completely helpless because you feel like there's nothing that you can do. And it's really hard to just sit back and let other people get on with trying to save your kid. But I think my my attitude was just I wanted to do everything possible that I could to help improve his odds. So, you know, that included cannabis. We also gave him lots of supplements. I gave him mistletoe shots as well. After When he went into remission, we gave him mistletoe shots three times a week for three years, which he hated. But I just thought, well, I just want to be able to do everything. I don't want to ever look back and think, oh, I wish I'd tried that, or why didn't... I didn't want to have any regrets. So my attitude was find out what can work, what can help, and do my best to get that stuff into him, which is what I did. And I I have no regrets about any of the things that I gave him. I'm sure I probably spent a lot of money on things that that had no effect or weren't very useful. But um, I found a naturopath that I trusted, um, and I found eventually found Aunt Zelda's. Um, and I just think you have to you have to just put your trust in people that really seem to know what they're doing, and then then you feel like you're taking some sort of um, con- not control, but inf- you're influencing. You're doing your best to try and uh, help your child survive, which is what it's all about, really, isn't it? I think what's, yeah. what's interesting about your story, uh, Angela, is the fact that even with substandard oil your son got better, he improved. And with Mara Gordon's oil from Aunt Zelda's, the improvement was probably even more dramatic. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Aunt Zelda's amazing. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, we interviewed Mara a couple of weeks ago, and she's really taking a scientific approach toward cannabis oil. Yes. There are so many people peddling either completely fake oil or really bad oil. I really hesitate to extol the virtues of oil because finding decent oil is so incredibly difficult, um, which, which is it's one of my big, big bugbears with this whole industry. There are so many people trying to make a quick buck on the back of people's health. Yeah. Um, and it really bothers me. And, and obviously it's because of prohibition, you know. it's it, All the, the, the baddies come out and try and make a quick buck because it's not properly regulated. There's, so, there's so many scammers out there, that's for sure. What's the prognosis for Chico, the long-term pro- prognosis? Is this a type of cancer that has a very high... High comeback rate, or is this that one that once it's cleared, you're pretty much in the clear? It generally depends on the subtype and the stage at which it was diagnosed. Um, Chico was diagnosed, he was stage three, group three, intermediate risk, which in his case meant that he had a 20 to 30 percent chance of relapse, which is, you know, not bad I suppose um, but then uh, we were also told that most relapses happen within the first year so once we got past the first year then it was slightly less scary um, but they continue to give him scans every six months and I think they're going to continue to do that until he's five years in the clear but I heard of a kid relapsing the other day after 14 years and he passed away within two or three months of relapsing so the fear now Never really goes never, away. Yeah, never leaves you. Um, and if you get if you diagnose with a with an aggressive subtype at stage four, then you've virtually got I mean, it's like a ninety five percent chance of relapse. So some of the rhabdos are a, a really horrible prognosis. Chico's was an intermediate prognosis. So we, we're never going to be completely comfortable. Uh, but I think the longer you are out, the better the prognosis is. Does Chico have any um, long-lasting side effects from the chemo and the radiation? I know you were getting his pituitary checked yesterday. Um, he is still, um, he's 14 pounds lighter than he was four years ago. So as a, as a 10-year-old, he weighed more than he weighs today as a 15-year-old. So he's definitely skinny still. He generally has no appetite unless he's had THC. Um, He does get nauseous 
more often than a normal person would get nauseous. But, I mean, these are all, you know, luxury problems. But the main thing that um, I'm concerned about is um, whether or not he may have growth issues because he's, he's in the bottom 5 percentile of both height and weight for his age. So yesterday we were at the hospital having, having the, the test to find out whether or not uh, there is an issue with his pituitary. So we're going to find that out in a week or two. Would that That's, be a result of the radiation? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the radiation field is very close to the pituitary gland and apparently it's very common that there is disruption in growth hormones if that is the case. Mm. So we'll find out about that. The, the other thing was the damage to his feet and legs. He is only now walking with his heels on the ground. It took about three years three to four years of, of physical therapy and um, manipulation. And he ended up going to a, a, a wonderful woman who does dry needling, which is like a form of acupuncture, but the needles go in deeper. Um, we often find that we, that we, it's the alternative treatments that seem to actually um, bring the results. You know, like the, the Western medicine couldn't really offer anything other than physical therapy to try and get his heels back on the ground other than surgery. And we really wanted to avoid him having to have surgery to release the tendon. It kind of sliced the tendon and I didn't want him to have to go through another surgical procedure. So um, so we've ended up doing it and he's, he's now walking. I'd say he's like 95% normal with his walk. He's got a bit of a strange gait still, but overall, no, he's doing really well. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot more serious complications that can happen. Luckily, um, he seems to have avoided most of those. So, but, so that's good. Is Chico taking just THC now, or is he taking CBD as well? He takes both. He takes about uh, 100 milligrams a day of, THC, uh, of CBD and 75 milligrams a day of THC. Yeah. And he takes them together or separately? He takes them separately. He separately, takes okay. Separately night and the cbd during the day yeah angela does he get high from that um does he get high no and um, the reason he, i ask that is because i would get wasted from that much yeah so would i uh no he he, he has a tolerance obviously um and if he sometimes say if he'd forgotten his dose one day and then he takes it or if he accidentally takes a bit too much he could get a little bit high um but high means like feeling quite mellow and actually feeling i mean he's never ever had any kind of negativity from taking oil he's never had any kind of anxiety or a panic i'm terrible i'm i'm very thc intolerant because it makes me anxious but he's always responded really well to it so even if he does have a little bit too much or if he, if he, if he forgets his dose and then he takes it, the, the worst thing that can happen is he feels a bit mellow and maybe a bit giddy sometimes. But, you know, I, I really think you know, so many parents are scared of, of the high. It's like it's this big, this big scary monster of a thing. I mean, he, he's never had a bad experience with the high. And I, I think as long as you titrate up slowly... You could avoid that. It's definitely not, not something to be to be afraid of. Um, it really is odd, isn't it, in our society today, in Western society, where cannabis is prohibited, that people are so afraid of taking cannabis, but they're so willing to yeah. give their children and themselves opiates and become addicts from that. Absolutely. I mean, the the amount of, of things he was on, it, he was on IV dilaudid, which mm. is extremely, a, a, an extremely strong version of morphine. I mean, it's like it's 10 times stronger than morphine. He was, they gave him Ativan, which gave him like hallucinations. All the kids were taking Ativan. To, uh, I mean, just really powerful, noxious medicines that yeah and then and then parents are afraid it's just because of it's just because of the um the stereotype it's just because it's been demonized and because it's cannabis if it was called something else and it wasn't illegal then there would be no fear about it the side effects of cannabis are absolutely nothing compared to the side effects of, of drugs like Ativan and the morphines and the dilodids i mean it's just i mean it doesn't bear they're just not comparable 
Angela, when you look back on what your son has gone through and what your family has gone through over the last few years, what goes through your mind? Um, <laughs> um, but it was in the clinic where he used to go for his chemo. And I wasn't expecting that. And it was like, oh, and my stomach, I'm just thinking about it now, my stomach just lurched because you see all the parents with that. I put a thing on Facebook about it, actually, like ashen-faced parents and bald kids with sunken eyes hooked up to drips with holding their pink buckets. And, like, ugh, my heart just lurched because I knew what those parents and kids were going through. And also it brought home to me, you know, we made some friends in that clinic that aren't there anymore, you know, and it's like, ugh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it really affected me actually yesterday. Sorry. No, it's no a, don't, don't I cannot, need to apologize. Yeah, you don't have to apologize. It's, it's uh, really, it must be an emotional downer to have to go through that clinic and, and see yeah. people's faces and see the sadness and the suffering, the suffering that they go through. It, it's also, it's it's really frustrating because I think that there's so much potential with cannabis and it's been largely ignored. Um, I mean, obviously things are changing slightly now as, as I think thanks very much to social media because they can't really keep, keep it under wraps for much longer. Um, but it just breaks my heart that there are so many people dying, probably unnecessarily. I mean, I'm not saying that cannabis is a magic bullet. I would never say cannabis cures cancer full stop you know it doesn't cure cancer in all cases we don't know the appropriate dosages we don't know the appropriate thc cbd other cannabinoid ratios that are appropriate for every different type of cancer it's all very much in its embryonic stage but it just bothers me that that more research is not being done as a matter of urgency because there's so much evidence to suggest that it is possibly a really really significant therapeutic tool and it's just being ignored and people are dying and kids are dying and parents are losing kids every single day and it's like it breaks my heart um i just think i don't know it, it it's it's too difficult to to comprehend really and um you know, it, where i'm from in england it's illegal and there are kids i mean i know cory knows jeff ditchfield who who has I think he has fifty at least fifty or sixty terminally ill kids that he supplies oil to and he risks going to jail for fourteen years for doing it and the parents risk being taken to jail and their kids being taken off them because they're trying to save their lives by giving them cannabis. I mean, it's the dark ages. Um so, you know, I mean, we're, that's why I feel like we're very lucky that we lived in California and we, at least we were able to do it legally. I can't imagine the stress and the strain that the parents in England are going through, not only having to deal with the fact that their kids are possibly terminally ill, but they're also having to do something illegally in order to try and save them. That just, I mean... <laughs> It's just barbaric that, that the parents are put in that position. You must wonder as well if what would have happened to Chico if you lived in the UK and not in California, where cannabis is legal medically and has been for over 20 years and now recreationally. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know whether I would have had, you know, well, it would have been virtually impossible for me to find probably in England four years ago because it wasn't as widely talked about as it is now mm. um, and I don't know whether I, I would have had the courage I don't know, would, would I have had the courage to break the law and, and risk going to jail and risk my kid being taken off me God, I hope I, I hope I would have had the courage to do it, but I don't. It made it a lot easier being in California and and being able to be honest with the doctor about it, because you're in such a state of fear that you you kind of deify the oncologist. It's like the oncologist is the person that's going to save the life of your child, and it's really difficult to go against anything that they say. And, and we were very lucky that we had a forward-thinking oncologist. He he was. I think he was 38 at the time, so he was kind of young enough to have an open mind, but old enough to have enough experience to know what he was doing. And whilst he wasn't fully supportive of what we were doing, he was very much tolerant and didn't try to stop us. The great part is that now he's actually on the scientific advisory board of Ants Elders, and they're working with him to devise trials. You know, he did a complete U-turn 
he did kind of roll his eyes when he knew that we were giving Chico cannabis oil. But as a result of having Chico as his patient and then subsequently a lot of other patients who've done oil, he's seen the benefits of it. He's now working um, with Ant's elders, which is amazing. And, and one of his nurses is currently doing um, an educational project um, to educate the rest of the paediatric oncology nurses about cannabis. Well, as so, uh, you know, things uh, are risk- Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, as uh, Mary Gordon said, the the key in educating people with uh, about cannabis is strictly talking about it, educating them, have have doctors, nurses, the medical community be supportive of it. And it's a long process. It's not going to happen overnight. But I think slowly, very slowly, people are beginning to realize that cannabis is a medicine. And it's a beneficial medicine for every human being on the planet. And I think there are two very separate issues here. Number one is it's a very useful palliative medicine. It's a useful medicine to relieve unpleasant symptoms um, and to relieve ailments um, that are not life-threatening. And I think that the medical community generally now, I think most of them are accepting of that. But I think the real exciting part is that the, the potential anti-tumour effects of the of the cannabis. That's where I really think that, that this has got the potential to, to really, really save lives. And I think therein lies the challenge. I think, you know, doctors are not so aware or accepting of, of that fact. And obviously we need more research to be done to, to, uh, to prove the point to them. Um, but I think generally the medical profession are now accepting at least, at least in California anyway, of, of the of the palliative effects. Um, but in the UK, goodness me, they're, in, they're still in the dark ages. You know, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything you'd like to uh, say in conclusion, Angela? Is uh, Chico there? Um, I can go and get him. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't have to. If he's you know, still, to- totally up to you. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, he's probably done this so many times. He's, he's fed up with talking about his, his problems. It's, Chico is like he's not an amateur dramatics type kid. You know, he's he doesn't want to be famous and on the stage and you know performer. But he's so driven to spread the message. He actually he finds it very uncomfortable talking to people, but he does it because he believes in it. Like he did a a, a talk at school recently. Recently, did a presentation to the parents and the kids, which was really quite amazing. And he's decided now that that's what he wants to do with his life. He wants to um, help kids with cancer get better and he wants to have a dispensary and he wants to learn all about cannabis medicine and, and that so he now has a path for his life for his future which is you know really quite amazing for a 15 year old I never thought that for his 14th birthday he asked could he have a grow tent because he wanted to start growing his own medicine um so i never thought that (laughs) 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 yeah no that that's a great story that is a very good story angela was wonderful to talk to you and uh, all the best to you chico and the rest of your family in the years ahead Thank you. Angela, thank you so much. It's been wonderful uh, to hear Chico's story and uh, to actually speak with you. And you too, Cory. And you're a, you're a real legend and an inspiration. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. And that's it. Another edition of Cannabis Health Radio. Wherever you are in the world, thanks very much for listening. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 